is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hi, this is Gannon Baker, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Hey, Hoop Heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoop Heads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Could you go back and tell your younger self something? I'd say, you know, I'd go say, hey, be yourself. You don't have to act like somebody you're not. And it's okay that you don't know. In fact, embrace the fact that you don't know and admit that you don't know. And just get crazy about learning and growing. Wes Miller finished his ninth season as the UNC Greensboro men's basketball coach in 2019-2020 after taking over the program in 2011 on an interim basis. Miller has spent the last nine years building a championship mentality throughout the UNC Greensboro program and has laid the groundwork for future success. The Spartans secured their fourth straight 20-plus win season in 2019-2020, finishing 23-9. Miller, then an assistant, took control of the program on December 13, 2011, with the Spartans sitting at 2-8 and and led them through one of the biggest turnarounds in program history. The Spartans lost their first six games under Miller to fall to 2-14 and on the season, but the program made a 180-degree turnaround, posting an 11-5 and record down the stretch. Miller, who was the youngest head coach in NCAA Division I at the time of his hire, made the removal of the interim tag an easy decision as he was named the Southern Conference Coach of the Year after leading the Spartans to the SoCon North Division title at the end of the 2011-2012 season. Prior to joining the Spartans, Miller previously spent two seasons as an assistant at Elon and High Point. In three seasons as a player at North Carolina under head coach and mentor Roy Williams, Miller helped the Tar Heels to the national championship in 2005, two Atlantic Coast Conference regular season championships, and one ACC tournament title. A fan favorite at University of North Carolina, Miller authored a book entitled The Road to Blue Heaven, which was published as a diary of his experiences as a North Carolina basketball player. After graduating from Carolina, Miller played one season of professional basketball for the London Capitals of the British Basketball League, where he averaged 19.6 points per game to rank 8th in the league. Be sure to register for our Hoop Heads Pod webinar series with some of the top minds in the game across all levels, from grassroots to the NBA. If you're focused on improving your coaching and your team, we've got you covered. Visit hoopheadspod.com webinars to get registered. Last week, we dropped Episode 1 of Thrive with Trevor Huffman the first show from our newly created Hoop Heads Podcast Network. This week, we're bringing you Beyond the Ball, a new podcast centered on the balance between faith, family, and basketball with coaches Justin Gerstung and Eric Klump. Make sure you check out both shows. The CoachMaze.com podcast featuring actionable advice for high school basketball coaches is coming soon. Please rate and review all our shows on your favorite podcast app. Get ready to take some notes as you listen to this episode with Wes Miller, head men's basketball coach, at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Hello, and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Mike Linting here without my co-host Jason Sunkel this morning, but I am pleased to welcome to the podcast from UNC Greensboro, head coach Wes Miller. Wes, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. We are excited to have you on, dive into all the great things you've been able to do in the game of basketball. Wanted to start out by going back in time when you were a kid. Talk to us a little bit about how you fell in love with the game of basketball. Well, I think I, you know, basketball was a part of my life for as long as I can remember. Um, My father was an athlete. He played baseball in college, and both my parents were always really into athletics and sports, but basketball just seemed to be the the sport we always gravitated to as a family growing up. So, you know, growing up here in AC country, uh, you know, grew up loving Michael Jordan, um, had a basketball in the backyard. You know, I got, I just, as far as I can remember, it was always a huge part of our family's life and, and of my personal life. And I fell in love with it at a really early age. 
Um, I, I would say by 10 years old, I knew that I wanted the rest of my life to be in basketball. I wanted to play college basketball, try to play professional basketball, and I thought I wanted to coach. So it's kind of as long as, long as I can remember, I've been in love with the game. So when you started thinking about making basketball your life, and obviously when you're 10, your first thought is, I want to be a player, and I want to get an opportunity to play college basketball and then eventually play in the NBA. What did your process look like in terms of trying to make that happen? It's funny. like. You know, I, don't, I haven't reflected a lot, you know, back on my childhood like this, but it, the watching the Bulls documentary, you know, The Last Dance has been a great way to like think back to some of the thoughts you had during that era. I was born in 83, so, it, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old when that stuff was going on in the 90s when they were making those runs. And I was like everybody, I was the biggest Michael Jordan fan. But I think it, it is I got to be 10, 11, 12 years old and, I kind of remember having those feelings of wanting to like have a life in basketball. I remember knowing that I was going to be short, you know, like having a realization <laughs> that I was going to be short. And I was in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time and Muggsy Bogues was playing for the Charlotte Hornets. And I remember him being like a real inspiration, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. look, like, look, mom, you know, some short guys can do it and that type of thing. So, I, you know, it's, it's weird as that may sound as a 10 or 11 year old, you know, guys like Spud Webb and Muggsy Bogues that were short, but that were playing at the highest level were, were pretty inspiring to me as a kid. What stood out to you most from the last dance? Well, I don't know if there's, if I have one really good answer to that. Like, if I feel like if I say something, it'll, you know, there'll be something else I'll think about when I hang, when I, you know, an hour later that I Absolutely. wish I would have said, totally you know, but, but like I, I thought for me, just, just personally, it, 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 it made me think of, my childhood, right? I, I was the kid that took the Michael Jordan Come Fly With Me videotape, like the VHS, and like put it in the TV every day and then went in the backyard and tried to like replicate those moves, <laughs> probably like millions and millions of other people. So then like kind of reliving that was really neat. And what was also really neat for me was talking to my current players about it, you know, because they didn't, you know, they obviously didn't watch that. They didn't live through that. So then now hearing, you know, how they perceived it after just watching those 10 episodes and then having dialogue with them, I thought was was neat. And it was something that we were able to connect on as a, as a program. What were their thoughts? Oh, they're funny. You know, we, we, we've recruited like basketball junkies here because we're kind of that way as a staff or we are that way as a staff. So we got a bunch of kids that just love hoops and talk about hoops all day. And so, you know, if you're on like a team bus with our team or you're in the locker room with our team, it's a pretty normal day for them to talk about, you know, who the best player in the NBA is or like that. That's like very normal or for them a talk. Actually, the word would be argue um, <laughs> for them to argue about who the best player of all time is and all that kind of stuff. And in the coaching staff, we always talk about Jordan. Right. So it's been really funny to hear them be like, yeah, coach, you know, Jordan may be the greatest of all time. He may be the GOAT. Like it, it, it kind of changed their perception. Um, but the one thing I've tried to explain to them that I think they started to see was, you know, culturally things were so different, right, without social media. But he was an icon like I don't think that we have in the modern day, like culturally, like forget basketball. Like I don't think – people realize or these guys realize how big he was in that era, you know, globally in the area before an era before social media. I mean, he, he was maybe the most recognizable person in the world in the nineties. And, um, I, I think the guys got a grasp of that, just that he was how big of a deal he was from watching. I thought that was really neat. Yeah, it was definitely something that when I watched it, just like you, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm 50. So when I go back in time and I think about that, I just remember how overwhelming his presence was both from a basketball standpoint, but as you said, also from a culture standpoint. And even though we didn't have that 24-hour social media window into his life like we do with some of the guys today, he still resonated so much around the world with everyone that that came through in the doc. And the other thing that I really – took away from it is just that competitiveness that one was in that era and then two he just took that to a huge extreme and I think the Roy Williams quote just about how he was a guy who could have turned it off but never did and I think that speaks more to 
who he was as a basketball player than anything else that came through the documentary. Uh, that's so well said. And that's a lot of the stuff we talked about with our guys, you know, is that his will to win was the greatest, that, you know, of all time from our perspectives. Right. And I think that came through, as you said, and I think that resonated with them, you know, and, and, and the, we talk all the time, you know, in the lot again, we, we, we love talking about this stuff. We talk all the time about, how the culture of basketball and the NBA, you know, has changed from the eighties and nineties, you know, till now and how it wasn't that friendly. So for them to, to see the, you know, this, the, the couple episodes where they talked about defeating the bad boys and, you know, to see, to see just how contentious some of those rivalries were and how it was a different type of approach. And it was so much more physical. Like our guys would talk about that you know, the day on Monday mornings and we were Monday afternoons when I talked to him on FaceTime, or whatever. So I agree. I thought that came through and I thought it was really good for those guys to see. I think that's the one thing that makes him stand out is just that competitiveness, that spirit that said, I'm not going to lose. I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. And when you're in the NBA environment and you have all these guys that have the tools from a physical standpoint that NBA players do, and then you just look at his mind and how far ahead he was in terms of that competitiveness. To me, that's what st- made made him stand out more than anything else. I agree. For this next generation of guys to be able to get a snapshot of that, even though they didn't live through it, I thought was really cool. And I think it'll that that documentary I think will affect young players today. I really like. He's had such an effect on people all over the world, especially in the game of basketball. I'm, and I'm sure from just talking to you, just me and you, like it. We were affected watching it, right? Like when we were growing up. So I think that he'll have a continuous effect. And I think this documentary will just be another way that he's influenced people. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. All right, let's jump back to you as a high school player. What's your best memory from when you were playing in high school? That's such a great question because we asked that question to every single player on our team in our last Zoom. We We do like an icebreaker to start every Zoom meeting during the quarantine. So, you know, so everybody talks and maybe, you know, we've, one thing we've tried to do is try to learn something about each other that we may not have known, you know, on these, these meetings. So that was our last icebreaker to start our Zoom talk a couple nights ago. And I, when I went, I, I, I answered honestly to them. So I'm going to give the same answer to you. Um, in 2002, I was a senior in high school at New Hampton School, which is a prep school up in New Hampshire. And we beat Worcester Academy in the New England championship game. Um, and Worcester Academy had Jared Jack at point guard and a guy named Craig Smith uh, on the interior, who both ended, ended up playing in the NBA, um, among a bunch of other great players. Like there's a guy named Brendan Winters that was, a, I think, a player of the year in the Southern Conference at Davidson, you know, went on. He came off the bench. I mean, it was an unbelievable team we beat, and we, we had a pretty good team as well. But to, to win a New England championship for the first time in, in that program's history in 2002. So that was by far my best basketball moment from high school. Let's talk a little bit about your recruitment. Talk about what that was like, your decision-making process. Obviously, you were at a prep school, which played into your recruiting and just how your process went along. So just talk a little bit about how you ended up at James Madison, and then we can transition into how you ended up making the decision to go to Carolina. Yeah, so, I mean – I was pretty under recruited as a player. I, I wasn't um, underexposed. <laughs> I played on you know great AAU teams. I played with the Charlotte Royals, um, you know, which was a in those days a, a Nike program out of Charlotte and out of North Carolina. And I, you know, Rashad McCants was on my AAU teams and a bunch of other guys. So we were one of the better AAU teams in the country. So I was highly exposed there, and then. Played with a couple NBA players on my prep school teams up in New Hampshire, and that was like you know really high profile prep school teams. So I was highly exposed. I think everybody saw me play, but not many people recruited me. And I, you know, just being under six feet, you know, not the most athletic guy off the floor. Um, you know, I, I think I was overlooked probably for good reason. And so my recruiting was primarily you know Ivy League and Patriot League schools. Um, you know, some schools in the Southern Conference, uh, military academies, things of that nature, and then some opportunities to walk on as recruited walk on at, you know, uh, 
Carolina, Wake Forest, and, and even Stanford talked about that a little bit when Coach Montgomery was there. So uh, that was kind of like the nature of my recruiting going through my senior year. I, I desperately wanted to attend Davidson. You know, I'd, they had recruited me but not offered me a scholarship for a couple of years. I'd spent some summers, you know, dr- I lived in Charlotte, so driving down to Davidson, which was a pretty short drive to play pickup with their players. Um, and they had a really good program. This is before Steph Curry, obviously, but they were still still really well known and had a lot of success under Coach McKillop. So I kind of was holding out throughout my senior year, hoping that they would pull the trigger. And at the last minute, you know, they did not. And then I was kind of sitting there in March, not knowing what I was going to do. And I took a visit to James Madison, um, had a great time, and uh, just kind of it was it was a pretty you know, quick decision. It wasn't something I'd been thinking about. I'd kind of, like most people, I'd approached the recruiting process strategically and was really, you know, they thought through things and taken my time. And then James Madison called me in early March and offered me a scholarship. I visited two weeks later and committed. (laughs) And, you know, and and like like a lot of young people probably made a little bit of a rash decision. Do you remember being frustrated that, you weren't more highly recruited with the type of teammates that you were planning with and the guys that you had an opportunity to play against. Did you ever feel like, man, I, I, sh- how come, how come I'm not getting these opportunities that these guys that I'm playing with and against are getting? I know I can compete at this level. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think people that know me well would would say that I have a pretty big chip on my shoulder and, <laughs> and competitively, and that you know, it, 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 I don't hide it, you know, and so I certainly. That certainly like was really obvious when you watched me play basketball, and that burned inside of me pretty bright. I was really motivated as a player and um, tried to get the most out of what I had, and and I did. I wanted to prove that I could play with anybody, and and mentally, I, I think I believed that. Like looking back on those days, but it was frustrating, you know, that you thought you could, you know, you could play with anybody, and you weren't being recruited that way. So you get to James Madison. What is the adjustment like from a from a playing standpoint you get out on the floor just explain what your freshman year was like well it was in some ways it was great um I I tell everybody I had a really cool experience there um don't regret that experience at all uh in in fact I I learned a lot about myself and it it propelled me to my experience in North Carolina which was life-changing but you know as you get into coaching your, your ability to relate to young people is, is super important to what we do every day, whether it's in recruiting or your current players. And so I, I think back to the experiences I had at James Madison all the time when, I, when I'm trying to relate or understand what our guys are going through, you know, or, or what guys we're recruiting they're going through. So I really value that time. But, I mean, my freshman year was up and down. I mean, I played I – I had a really good role coming off the bench. You know, I played – significant minutes in the rotation as we got into into conference play I you know I had some bunch of double figure scoring games and you know we we won some games against George Mason and BCU you know where I at William and Mary or you know where I hit a bunch of threes and I mean I, I think the senior night Jeff Capel was coaching at BCU I got fouled with like a two seconds left uh down one and made two free throws you know, under two seconds to win the game. So there were some great moments, but there were some difficult moments too. We, we had a disappointing season that year. We had a really talented team with like five seniors and two juniors, all were rotation guys, so seven upperclassmen. And we, we kind of underachieved. You know, we, we probably had a chance to compete to win that league and, you know, finished around 500. So it was a really, it was a really frustrating year at times, but as a freshman, being able to step into a great league in the Colonial at that time was a great league. Uh, you know, and contribute and, you know, have some great moments that, that, that that's kind of how I look at my freshman year. So what were some lessons that you took from that, that you now apply when you're building relationships with your kids that you coach today? Well, I mean, wow, probably to probably narrow that down would be unfair. I mean, everything, right? Like, you know, to remember how I felt as an incoming freshman, you know, when we deal with our incoming freshmen, remember how I felt when I moved into the dorm for the first time, you know, and the things that, you know, I really appreciated and valued, the things that maybe I wish were done better, you know, to, re- to remember, you know, the, the mental 
ups and downs that we go through. You know, I, I think I think trying to have a real understanding of those things helps when you're formulating whatever your value system is or your protocols are for how you deal with with your with the people you're leading, right? Um, it, when they're going through those same things, and so you know, we have a really I don't know like strict process for how we deal with our players when they show up for the first time in summer school, you know, like how we manage, manage that with their families and, you know, like their move in and all that kind of stuff. And that's just one very small example, but it goes back to how I I felt, you know, you know, remembering that it's, it's a little, you know, scary when you move into a college dorm for the first time, you know, and your parents leave you, it's really scary for your mama, you know? And so we try <laughs> yeah. to always do a good job with mom on, but like, for sure. you know, and, and so that's just one example, but there's probably hundreds like that. And, and I always kind of look back to my experiences and try and try to relate to them. All right. So then how does the opportunity to go to North Carolina, just explain how that comes to pass? Wow. It, it's uh, tr- I'll try to keep it short, but <laughs> just like anything in life, you know, it's amazing how things happen. But when I was playing at New Hampton, Rashad McCants, again, was my AAU teammate, and, and a, we were really close friends growing up, and we were teammates in prep school and roommates in prep school. And he was being, you know, he was a McDonald's All-American, and he's been recruited by everybody in the country, um, literally everybody. And so the, if you got to think back to like 0102, you know, cell phones were out for sure, but not every kid had a cell phone. And I remember I had a Nokia, like a Nokia long skinny cell phone in those days, and, and Rashad didn't, and, and a lot of guys didn't have them. And there was only one pay phone in our dorm. So, you know, it was really hard to get a hold of players, different than it is now. And so a lot of the coaches somehow found out that you could get to Rashad by calling my phone. You know, and which was which was annoying. <laughs> you know? You're a middleman. Uh, you go. Sure, I, I wanted to be recruited by the schools that were calling Rashad, and you know they would call, they would call my phone, but not to talk to me. And so uh, I'll, I'll never forget. A lot of them will call and just kind of ask to put Rashad on the phone. But Joe Holiday was recruiting Rashad from Kansas. He was Coach Williams' assistant at Kansas in those days, and he would call me, and and we would talk for like 20 minutes. And then he probably talked to Rashad for like five minutes and then hang up. So we just got to know each other. Um, you know, not that he was recruiting me you know, by any sense, um, but we built a relationship and I always thought he was really genuine, which he is. And, you know, fast forward a year and a half later, I was transferring from James Madison. I was took a visit to Columbia and Penn, and I was going to choose between going to one of those two places in the transfer process. Uh, Coach Williams and his staff had just gotten the job at Carolina, and Coach Holiday, you know, reached out to me about possibly walking on and asked me to come down and sit down with Coach Williams in Chapel Hill, my dad and I, and kind of do an unofficial visit. And I'll be honest, I wasn't really interested in it. I never kind of viewed myself as a as a walk on, um, but but decided to go down there and sat down with Coach for two hours, and I was amazed that he spent that much time with me. Um, but I remember the kind of the defining moment he asked, asked me what I wanted to do when I was done playing basketball. And I told him I wanted to coach and he was adamant that, you know, being a part of the North Carolina basketball family would give me the best chance to have success in coaching if that's what I really wanted to do. And he, he didn't mean it. He said, I don't mean it arrogantly, but you know, you just look at the history and the tradition uh, and you'll be a part of that and you'll be able to use this network. And so that was a real defining moment in my decision to go to Carolina. And I'll, I'll be honest, when I was driving to Chapel Hill that day, I had no intention of going there, but it was trying to think about life after my four years of college that probably influenced my decision there the most. So that conversation resonated with you immediately. It, it did. It really did. And, and, you know, coach, if you, anybody that's ever really been able to spend time with him, he has a way of explaining things and communicating things that resonate, you know, and penetrate you. And, you know, I remember that that really impacted me, especially as I left and I thought more about that. Um, you know, certainly I, I wanted to play. I, I like I, I, I didn't I wasn't a coach when I was 19 years old. Right. Like I, I was a right. player, man. I it, 
shoot, I still sometimes kind of think like a player. <laughs> I wish I could I still, I wish I still had it, you know, but I wanted to play. And so it was hard to get my mind around going somewhere where you, you knew deep down you may never play. Um, and I was really scared of that. Um, cause I, I couldn't imagine not competing, not playing. He made it really clear that I'd have opportunities, um, that, you know, whether I was on scholarship or not, would have nothing to do. And he talked about other guys he'd had, like C.B. McGrath, you know, that had played and had a role, even though they weren't, you know, scholarship guys. So I, speaking to that really influenced me too. But I think ultimately it was a long-term decision when I, when I got to a place maybe a week later that that's what I decided to ultimately do. So obviously that piece of it, has been beneficial as you look at your coaching career. Talk a little bit about what the experience was like as a player. Obviously, your first year, there's a national championship, pretty good. Second year, you get to start a lot of games and play a lot of minutes. So it seems like it worked out on both fronts. Talk a little bit about your playing experience at Carolina. Yeah, so, you know, listen, it was, it was overall, it was a dream. Right. I, you know, I, I lived out a dream, you know, when you look at it big picture. But when you go back and break down the process of it, it was really difficult. <laughs> at sure, times. Sure, it sure, was really sure. hard at times. And, you know, my first couple years were really difficult years because, you know, I was up against Raymond Felton every single day for two years. And it, as a, maybe as a red shirt, it wasn't that challenging because, you know, you couldn't play anyway. And so you just kind of play with a little more freedom and confidence and practice every day. Um, but my, my, my first year eligible, my, my second year, we won the national championship, as you mentioned. So my redshirt sophomore year, 2004, 2005, we win the national championship at the end of the year, which at this point in my life is one of the greatest things that I've ever been a part of and has impacted me in everything I've done since then. And it's one, it's one of the great lessons that I tell my team every year because but if you if you go back to that year up until the sweet 16 it was probably the most difficult year of my life to that stage you know and i've had a pretty darn good life by the way but i i wanted to play so bad i loved playing so much and i didn't play all year and i was miserable you know i was even though we were good personally i was miserable on the bench not playing and not getting in games um now i I was a good teammate and I understood the, you know, my role and I didn't cause problems in the locker room. I don't mean to say that, but I, th I think if you ask the coaches back then and teammates, like I was, it was a tough year for me, not just not playing, even though we were the number one team in the country. Um, so that was a really difficult thing for me as a competitor and as somebody that had played on every team I'd played on my entire life to that point. Shoot, I'd, I'd been a you know starter or my year at JMU was a key reserve on every team my entire life. And then, you know, you're sitting there on the end of the bench. But what was really cool about it and what's really cool now is that year changed my life and changed the outcome of my life moving forward because I was a part of something so much bigger than myself. But I didn't even realize it at the time. And, 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 you know, until you get into the tournament and you look up and you go, wow, like this is pretty neat. We're in the Sweet 16. Or, <laughs> yep, yep. wow, this is pretty cool. We're in the Elite Eight. And then you're in the Final Four running out for an open practice in front of 50,000 people. And, you know, like then you, you know, at least me, it was like, wow, okay. You know, like I, I can't believe I've been so short sighted all year. So I really grew up a lot that year and was really able to put some things in perspective and, now I look back and I've never been introduced anywhere since then, you know, when I, and, and asked to speak and we speak all the time as, as head coaches all over the place, I'm never introduced anywhere without being called a national champion. And so, and I, and I really think that's benefited me in ways that I don't even understand yet. And so I think it's a really powerful lesson for young people to hear when, when the organization has success, everybody benefits everybody everybody gets more than they otherwise would have gotten and i'm a testament to that because i played it, it, this is another thing that's really interesting and i ask my team this every year you know I, this was 2005 we're 15 you know years later now and it's not that long ago and i ask them hey guys how many minutes do you guys think that i played in the national championship game and they'll go oh 10 15 
you know, how many points do you guys think I scored? Why well, you probably hit a couple threes because people always tell them that I was a good shooter. <laughs> and and I'll go, guys, I didn't get in the game. Like, I didn't check in. And nobody even cares now. I mean, seriously, in fact, Carolina right. fans come up to me sometimes and go, I remember watching you, you know, in the Final Four National Championship game. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't even play in that game. <laughs> but I played later in my career and people just get, you know, the point is, you know, time goes by and people don't care about your personal accolades like we think they do in the moment. You know, people just care that you are a part of something. And uh, and so I think it's been a really cool lesson to teach my team. It's something that I don't talk a lot about my playing career at all, but that that is one thing that I talk about to start every year, that if, if our team has success, we'll all get more personally at the end of it than we otherwise would have gotten. Do you think it also helps you to have – more empathy for the players at the end of your bench who don't play as much, who are your reserves. Whereas if you had maybe stayed at James Madison and never had to go through that experience of not playing, that maybe you would have had a more difficult time relating to their experiences. I, I actually think this is a strength. Um, you know, I, I, I was able to, I've been every single thing you could be on a basketball team as a player. I, you know, I was the, I've been, a, I was a starter um, you know, I've been a key my senior year. I came off the bench. My freshman year at JMU, I came off the bench as a key reserve. My junior year at Carolina, I was a starter. I actually started all through high school. I, my sophomore year at Carolina, I, you know, was buried on the end of the bench trying to figure out how to get a minute. And, you know, I redshirted. So I, I know what it's like to not even be allowed to play in the games. And then my I played one year professionally in England, and I was the best, I was the best player on my team there. Um, which tells you a lot about how good that team was. <laughs> you know, if I'm the best player, but that was the first time in my life I'd been on a team, a competitive team that where I was the best player. And so I feel like I've kind of been in, in some way in every position you can be in as a player. And I understand the, the things that are great about that and the challenges. Like I, I'll tell you what, being the best player on a team is much more difficult than people think. You know, I think some people, sometimes players think, man, he's the guy that gets the most shots or, you know, gets to do the most or has the most leeway offensively. But that also comes with a, a lot of challenges people don't realize. I, I, I couldn't, couldn't believe that was the last year I played competitive basketball in England, how tough it was to be at the top of every scouting report and, you know, have the best player, defensive player assigned to you every game. And it's it can be very, very difficult and frustrating. So, no, I, I think playing different roles – from my, you know, prep school all the way through professionally is, is really helped me try to relate to the guys that, that play different roles on our team now. What's your funniest story of playing overseas? Oh, man, there's quite a bit. I mean, Everybody I don't know if they're one, funny. So. There's, quite, there's, quite, there's quite a few stories. I don't know if they're funny or not. They're funnier now looking back on them. But I remember, you know, like – my perspective at 37 is so much different than, you know, 24, 25. But, I, For sure. I, you know, you're coming off of – I was coming – my last game I played in college was in the Elite Eight against Georgetown to, you know, to go to the Final Four. And we were up eight – or up eight or ten with like eight minutes left and ended up losing in overtime. But, I mean, you know, that – think about you're playing – we are playing in New Jersey in the Meadowlands and, you know, packed – national television at the you know on the highest state you know the biggest stage uh, you know against I mean shoot everybody on that court was probably an NBA player I think I played I don't know so double figure minutes in that game so that was my last college game and then my first professional game I think I played in front of like 100 people um and so the transition from you know what i had been doing I th- you almost felt like you took a bunch of steps backwards right from going from that because everybody, everybody hears professional basketball. Like, that's just a very loose term to me. Because <laughs> there's everything from rec ball to the NBA and, and everything in between, right? And, and so that was really difficult for me. But I, I think where it really hit me the first time, you know, we, we, our first road trip, they told us to show up at the, the arena we played in. Gosh, like, let's just say they said show up at noon and we're going to take a, take a bus, um, so I, you know, if you, if you played basketball for coach Williams and you're supposed to be anywhere, you know, you get there 10 minutes early or, or you're not going to be comfortable. Right. And so 
I think I got there 10 minutes early. And not only did we not leave until like 1.30, like an hour and a half later because the, the bus didn't show up. It, it, it ended up not being a bus. It was, it was two vans and a car. We caravaned to up to Newcastle, which is – we were in London. Newcastle is far north in England. And I, I'd have to go back and like do it on MapQuest or Google Maps or something. But it, 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 it felt like a six- or eight-hour drive. In, in, in little vans and in a car, you know, following behind us with the whole team. And I think that was the moment that I went, man, I, professional basketball is a really loose term. And I don't know if I'm going to have a career in this because <laughs> where I'm starting, <laughs> you know, to where I have to go, I don't think I'll ever get, you know, to where I want to go. But I, I, I don't know. That, that was like a kind of an aha moment. And so was that what led you to say, hey, I'm going to pack this in and get started with my coaching career? No, no, not at all. That was really, again, that was our first road trip probably in September. And no, I, it wasn't that simple for me. It was really hard to hang them up for me. I, I loved playing. I, I can't stress that enough. I, I, I still wish I could play. I miss being able to play basketball. I love playing the game. Um, but I, I just think as I went through that year, you know, I realized that, you know, my ceiling was pretty low and that, you know, could I, you know, hang on and play a couple years and, you know, move up a league or two. I'm, I'm sure I could have done that, but that I, I did want to accomplish something professionally. I, I wanted to get on to a real career. And I think I kind of realized as I went through that year that, you know, my, I wasn't going to have a real career per se as a professional basketball player. Um, and so throughout that, that time in England, you know, I started formulating this idea that I wanted to get into coaching. So it was a really, by the time I got home, I was I was ready to to start a, a new path and, and jump right into coaching. Was it something specific about coaching that you loved, or was it more just I knew I wanted to be involved in the game? Yeah, I, I think you know I've said this to people because you know players come to my office all the time. Hey, I want to coach. I want to coach, and that's kind of how I was. I I think it growing up, and even at that stage in my life in college and right afterwards. I wanted to coach because it was an extension of the game. Like I, I was in, I'm, I've been in love with basketball since I can remember. So that was just natural, right? You play and then you coach. Um, I don't think I understood, you know, coaching at all. And I don't, I don't think I understood what coaching was all about. It was just like you said, an extension of the game. It's really well said. And I, and I think when most young people say they want to coach, that's more what they're saying is I want to stay in basketball. You know, and, and that was that was probably me at that stage. So when you do start coaching, what was something that was surprising to you about coaching that maybe you didn't know coaches spent so much time on this or they you didn't know they did that? What were some things that were surprising to you? Everything. <laughs> I, I, honestly, everything. I I tell people, you know, often now that I I thought I wanted to coach growing up. And then I got into coaching, and for my first two or three years, if I'm being really honest now, I, I probably wasn't capable of saying this at the time, but my first two or three years in coaching, I'm not sure if I knew I wanted to coach or not, you know, as I started to figure out what it was. And then, you know, after two or three years, I think it really hit me that not only do I want to do this, but it, it feels like it, it, it feels right inside of me. Right. It just feels like, you know, I, I don't I don't like, like faith that I found a profession that, you know, I get out of bed every morning with energy to go do what I do every day. So I think it was, you know, like if you asked me when I was eight years old, what do you want to do when you grow up? I say I want to be a basketball coach. But I don't think it was till after a couple of years coaching basketball at the college level that it, I really realized in my heart, this is this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So what were some of the first things that you looked at and said, hmm, this isn't what I thought it was going to be? Well, I mean, you know, I, I got hired by Ernie Nestor at Elon, um, gave him my first job. I'll forever be grateful for that. And I was the third assistant and the ops, which it gets, it's always funny how quickly things have changed, right? <laughs> There's right. No, they don't have those jobs in Division One anymore. But I, I believe I was making like $20,000. I, I may or may not have had benefits, um, I, I mean, and you know, you're, so I wasn't even recruiting, which I really wanted to do. Um, you know, I was basically doing film exchange and team travel and, you know, 
skill development and, and that type of thing. And so, you know, I think sitting in there doing film exchange, you know, all summer working on the film exchange was probably like that moment, like, man, I didn't realize this is what happens, <laughs> right? Like, I, you know, and, and film exchange was so different because it wasn't digital right, when I first got into it. You know, I remember that just being feeling like, wow, this is this is a job like we're not on the court all day. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of guys that, that played when they get into coaching is, especially in college, is a lot of the work is done that you do. I mean, 80 percent of the things we do don't involve basketball. Like the basketball is the reward. That's the fun stuff. And so it is it is a job in a lot of ways. And I thought that was a transition for me, for sure. So how let's jump ahead a little bit and talk about the transition from when you go from being an assistant to being a head coach. And obviously the level of responsibility jumps at that point. So just talk a little bit about what that transition was like for you. I'll tell you what, when I coached my first practice, I, I knew I wanted to coach forever. You know, like it was, it was like the, the same thrill or adrenaline, adrenaline rush I ever got from playing a game, but multiplied. You know, uh, and so I, it, I was young. I was 27, I believe, when I became the interim coach. I mean, we, we had really had a tough year and a half. I'd been at UNCG for a year and a half. My first year, we started – my first year as an assistant at UNCG, we started the season 0-15, um, which is incredible to think about. And, I, again, I was a young assistant, but 0-15 is miserable. If any, if any, uh, when people complain about losing, <laughs> I always go, man, we, we, we won our 16th game at Appalachian State, and it was is about as exciting as winning the national championship in 2005. Um, yeah, I'll never forget that. But, I, you know, we've had a tough year. And, and by the way, it, it, there were a lot of things that were not set up in our favor. I mean, if you go back and look at the non conference schedule in those years at UNCG, it, you know, I think. The year that we were 0-15, I think we played of 11 non-conference games. Seven of them were against the ACC. We played VCU, Richmond, and East Carolina and North Carolina A&T. Those were our 11 non-conference games. And VCU, I think, went to the Final Four that year. Richmond, I think, was coming off a Sweet 16 season. And, you know, uh, Jeff Lebo... I don't really know if Jeff was there yet. It might have been the year before Jeff got to East Carolina, but they, they were they were really good. So my point is, it, you know, 0 and 15 was bad, but we weren't really set up for success either. Um, and so it was a difficult year and a half, and, and we'd lost a lot, and it was unfortunate. But Mike Dement was let go, and you know, the athletic director comes and goes, "Hey, we're gonna make you the interim coach and just finish the year off. We're gonna do a national search, and you know, you'll be a candidate." Um, but you know, kind of one of those things that, you know, you just feel like you got to go do your job, but I'll admit it was exciting. Like looking back on it, cause you get to, you get to be the head coach, you get to coach your own practice and do things your own way. And I think as assistants, you always sit there and, you know, you have opinions when you're a head coach, you get to make decisions. And so that was exciting. It was kind of a nothing to lose scenario. Um, but I'll never forget coming out of that first practice, like, wow, this, this is better than playing. And, and that, I mean, that was kind of another aha moment. I think, transitioning into being a head coach. As you were working up as an assistant and you were thinking about your career and the path that you were going to take, had you been preparing that someday you were going to be a head coach? Did you have a notebook, computer file, things that you had put together that you said, if I ever get a chance to take over my program, these are the things that I'm going to start to try to do from day one. Did you have that kind of thing in place or was it more like I've been an assistant a head coach in position is kind of far off down the road. Just where was your mindset at that point? Yeah. One of my first practices at North Carolina, you know, Coach Williams called me over and shoot, I was I, my first couple of years at Carolina. Every time he talked to me, I was nervous, you know, uh, and he's, he's changed a lot now. You know, he's adjusted to the culture now and to the kids now. But in those days, you know, the head coach didn't talk to you a lot. <laughs> you know, and right. so he called me over on that. I'll never forget it. And he said, Hey, you know, you still want to coach? Cause that was, again, was a big part of how he recruited me. I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I want you to keep a notebook of everything we do here. Keep every practice plan, 
you know, keep, keep a notebook of everything we do. And I did that. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't always keep a good track of practice plans, but I did have, you know, the, one of the guys on staff print them all out for me at one point. So, but I, I kept all that stuff. And as I got into, into coaching and became an assistant, I absolutely wanted to be a head coach. And so I would, I'd keep notebooks and I, I was really big at learning from other people and going to clinics. And yeah, so I, I had an idea of if I become a head coach, this is what I want to do. And this is how I want to do it. Absolutely. What was the biggest challenge in terms of building the kind of culture that you knew you needed to have there in order to win? Wow, it was really, there were so many challenges in that sense because we had lost, the program had lost for a really long time. And again, I, I want to, can't be clear enough that I don't think if you look back at the way things were set up from a scheduling standpoint and a bunch of other dynamics that were at play then, it wasn't set up to be successful. But regardless, when you lose like that, it becomes a part of your day-to-day -day mindset, right? And your day-to-day -day attitude. And that was really present in that program. And as I look back now, it's really clear I wasn't prepared to change that. You know, I, I, I thought I was. I thought I could. Um, but I wasn't. And, and it, it took a couple of years to try to and, – and a ton of mistakes and a ton of errors. And I'm really fortunate I'm still here because, honestly, after my second full season, um, so two and a half years in as a head coach, you know, we had seven guys walk out, of, you know, walk out on us in a three-day stretch after the season. You know, we had seven guys either transfer or turn pro in a three-day stretch. And I honestly thought I was going to lose my job. And, you know, you, you look back on that, and that was one of the real – that's the most difficult professional moment, you know, those, those years that I've ever been through. But we learned so much making those mistakes, and the administration, you know, the leadership at UNCG stuck with us when, when a lot of people would have probably let us go. And, you know, I think that helped us learn and grow and formulate a value system and, and figure out an identity and a, and a couple of principles to live by. And, and I think that's kind of led to some of the, the success, the relative success we've had, you know, since that day. So, you know, those first two or three years were incredibly hard. I, I probably screwed it up about as many ways as you can screw it up. Um, but I value that now more than ever because it's, it's probably where I learned the most in terms of building, you know, a, a mindset or a day-to-day -day approach or culture, whatever terminology you want to use. All right. Two questions related to that. One, what is a mistake that you make in those early years that someone else who's just becoming a head coach can learn from? And then number two, what's something that you think back to those early years that you weren't very good at then that you feel like you're much improved at today? Yeah. Well, the, the first mistake is probably, you know, feeling like I had to act like a head coach or, hold, you know, carry myself like a head coach or communicate with people like a head coach. You know, when you're, you know, I probably looking back on it, didn't have a lot of confidence that I was ready or prepared because I wasn't, <laughs> right? I, was, I, I wasn't. I didn't have a ton of experience. I'd never been a head coach and so because deep down I probably knew I wasn't prepared or wasn't ready, I would I felt like I had to act a certain way or be a certain way instead of being genuine and being myself, you know, and and so I think that and it's kinda of hard to explain that, but I think that would be the biggest mistake I made. You know, just realizing, you know, that it it you just be you, you know, and, and be authentic and be genuine and you know That'll be good enough. I, I think, and I, I look at what we do now, you know, I think in those days, I was so scared to make a mistake or admit to a mistake. You know, now I, I know I don't know everything. I'm, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm going to try like hell every day to try to figure it out and get better and grow and learn. But I realize I don't have it all figured out. I think in those days, I knew deep down I didn't have it all figured out, but I didn't want anybody else to know that. That's so true. That is That is so true. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I'd like to, if you could, you know, always that question, could you go back and tell your younger self something? I'd say, you know, I'd go say, hey, be yourself. You don't have to act like somebody you're not. 
And it's okay that you don't know. In fact, embrace the fact that you don't know and admit that you don't know and just get crazy about learning and growing. What's then something that you've gotten a lot better at, whether it's something off the floor, on the floor, teaching wise, just that you've improved on over the course of your career? You know, I, I had a really good friend of mine, one of my great friends in coaching is a high school coach at uh, Linkier Prep, a guy named Adam Donier. He used a term, and he, he read it somewhere, so I don't think it's an original term, but he talked about relationship equity. You know, he used the term. I thought that was like a great term. He told me that on the phone yesterday. And I, I think I think just spending time and energy on building like real genuine relationships with the people in our organization, you know, our, our staff members, you know, players, you know, people, you know, families, like, I think that's something that every year I value more and more. And not only, and it, it is strategic, like, because it's so important to the fabric of what we're trying to do. But at the same time, what I learn is I enjoy that, you know, that I, I really enjoy building these positive relationships with people that I care about. And that the, the more we invest when, into each other, the more care and love there is and that type of thing. So, I think like there's something when I got into coaching, it was about basketball, right? Like this was about a love for the game as I've, you know, been fortunate to stay in this profession over time. That hasn't, I haven't lost that at all. I I love the game. Maybe more now than ever, but you know, I, now I also have feel so much value and purpose in working with people um, and, 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 and feeling like in some small way you're able to help some people if that makes sense. No, it makes total sense. And I think that's something that the entire coaching profession has shifted in that direction. And when I hear a coach like yourself or other guys that we've had on the podcast, that's a theme that comes through very often is that those relationships have become so much more important to them than maybe they were at the beginning of their career as they were focused on, just like you said, I love basketball and I want to be involved with basketball. And basketball was number one. And as you realize, as you go through this, those relationships are really what matters and that's really what's important. And basketball is the vehicle for creating those relationships and helping to move them forward. And obviously with your players, helping them to be able to have the success that you want them to have in their life. Eventually we're pushing up on your time limit here, Wes. So I want to ask you one more question. It's kind of a two-parter and then we'll wrap things up. What is your biggest challenge moving forward at UNC Greensboro? And then two, what is your biggest joy when you get out of the bed in the morning? What's something that just drives you? Like, I can't wait to get to this part of my job. Hey, well, I'm going to start with the second question, if that's okay. Sure. I say this all the time. I, like, to feel like a fire in your belly when you wake up in the morning to go do what you do has to be one of the greatest gifts, right, or greatest blessings. And I feel that. Like, I, I feel this intense sense of purpose every day. And I, I just don't take that for granted. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, like it's it cha- the, the answer to your question, the second question, changes in different points of the year, right? Like, I mean, I, it, when we start practice, man, I'd wake up like thinking about practice. <laughs> you know, my players are probably laugh if they hear that because they know it's true. Like, but I wake up like thinking about what we have to accomplish that day in practice and how we're going to structure that practice and, you know, what I have to talk, you know, having that conversation with certain guys on my staff as I'm writing that practice, I'm going to write the practice. I'm in the shower, like thinking about all these things or, you know, what player I have to talk to about some thought we had. I wake up thinking about basketball and like what we have to accomplish as a team in practice or in that game, whatever. Um, So during the year that I wake up thinking like that, I think in the off season, I think I probably wake up thinking about, you know, what we got to do to get better individually a little bit, little bit more, right? I wake up thinking about is Isaiah Miller going to get his shots up this morning? Like, you know, like is he getting right. his form shooting in because he's got to work on his free throw shooting and his three point shooting? You know, I wake up thinking about is James Dickey, you know, doing his extra stretching because we got to work on his, you know, like flexibility in his hips. I mean, like that. I think probably wake up with like this deep sense of purpose to try to make sure they're they're developing, um, if that makes sense, and in all kinds of ways. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, if, if it's one thing. I, but I just wake up excited to attack the job. I, I really do. 
Um, I can tell you this. I don't wake up thinking about like balancing budgets and stuff. <laughs> so there are parts of the job I don't. The administrative stuff? You're not waking up dreaming about that? Yeah, no doubt. And what was the first question again? First part was what's your biggest challenge moving forward? Oh, you know, there's there's so many of them. And we haven't arrived by any sense. But I, I think it was interesting. I, you know, we've talked about this a lot this spring with our team. You know, we we struggled here for a long time. And we had a group of guys that kind of dug in with us. And, and I think about like Deontay Baldwin and Francis Alonzo and Jordy Kuyper and K.L. Locke and Nick Paulus. And, I, and, and if I keep going, you know, them, if I keep going, I'll leave somebody out. But just it get the list goes on. Those guys know who they are that dug in with us because they were and they were so sick of losing. They were willing to do anything they could to change that. And the program turned the corner you know, under those guys' leadership on the court. And they kind of instilled some of those values in the next group, right? And then, you know, the next group instilled some values. But I think, and and we've been able to put together, you know, in my opinion, five years of of really good basketball teams. And the, 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 the second half of my team five years ago was the first team that played in a non-conference an, an, or a, a postseason tournament here. We, and the first time we had a winning record in the Southern Conference, we were 10 and 8 in the league that year. So, you know, as I look back, this past year's team, which was a great team, and we had a great year, even though we didn't finish well, you know, it was the first time I had guys on my roster that had never lost. You know, like this, this, this senior class I had this year, which James Dickey, Kyron Galloway, Malik Massey, they were unbelievable players in our program, leaders, I, what they've meant to this program can't be expressed in words. They won 104 games in four years. You know, they won 25 their freshman year, 27 their sophomore year, 29 their junior year, and 23 this year. And I think we'd had a chance to win some more in the NIT. And so they never lost. And I think it created a different type of challenge. Because they didn't remember, that they didn't experience it, what it was like to really lose. And I think, so one of our challenges is trying to figure out how to get that type of a fire to burn, for lack of a, a better better term, with a bunch of guys that have had a lot of relative success. And I think that that's that challenge that I think a lot of programs have when you have some sustained success is trying to figure out how do you take another step forward. And uh, psychologically, like that, that's one thing we've thought about a lot during this quarantine. Yeah, it's a different mental state altogether to go from being a losing program to being a program that wins. There's obviously that chip in your shoulder that you talked about earlier. And now to keep success going, that's a challenge. Yeah, and, and, and not only to sustain it, but to, to, to build on it, because we're not going to be okay sustaining anything, right? Like this is about growth. And, uh, you know, I, it's just funny, you know, you, and, and this, this team this year was phenomenal. I had so much fun coaching them. Like we have unbelievable kids and, but there were times in shoot arounds where like a little detail would be overlooked and it would frustrate the heck out of me. Cause I remember losing, I remember Owen 15, right? We talked about <laughs> right. that earlier. Um, and those details are separators. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we had guys that remembered losing games because of that particular detail or something like it that would step up and be, and you know, express that to the team. And, and at times we didn't have that this year. And, and I, again, we had unbelievable leadership. Like, I, you know, our, our seniors in our upperclassmen leadership was exemplary, some of the best I've ever seen. But there were, there were some things that weren't there. And I actually blame myself as a coach for not recognizing that earlier. And now we're trying to figure out how to get more detail oriented. But I think some of that happened in our program previously because guys were just so sick of losing. And now we we need to figure out how to have that same type of edge or chip, as you mentioned, you know, without having to go through that type of year, we hope. Absolutely. Wes, I can't thank you enough for spending an hour or so here with us this afternoon want to give you a chance before we get out to let people know how they can follow your program, find out more about what you guys are doing. And then after you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap up the episode. Okay. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you so much for having me.
Absolutely. What's the best way for people to follow UNC Greensboro basketball? Um, you know, on our website, uh, you know, which you, you can find on Google. I don't even know the thing, uncgspartans.com. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, and then, you know, obviously our, our uh, Instagram and Twitter handles will be great as well. Awesome. We'll put that all in our show notes. Can't thank you enough, as I said, for spending some time with us this afternoon. It's been an absolute pleasure getting a chance to learn more about you and your program. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.